Okay, we will begin our webinar. I would uh, like to welcome everyone. Thank you for joining today. And this is the webinar called Cambium PMP 3000, uh, What You Need to Know. And I'd like to start by introducing uh, Garrett Kelman from CTI Connect. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining. I see a lot of uh, familiar faces here attending again, um, a lot of repeat um, customers and attendees from a couple weeks ago with the Cambium 450 one. So thank you for joining again today. Also see some unfamiliar uh, names. So I will do a little brief um, background on CTI Connect. CTI Connect has um, been servicing the telecom market for the past 25 years. Um, Sakid, you can jump to the next slide uh, if, uh, if you don't mind. Yep, thank you. So CTI Connect is a premier distributor of fixed wireless telecom and network infrastructure. Like I said, we've been servicing ISPs, utilities, enterprise, and transportation markets in North America and Cala for about the last 25 years. Um, we offer world-class engineering, network design, and superior supply chain services. We currently have two distribution centers, one outside of Chicago, Illinois, and one outside of Austin, Texas. Um, you know, we, we are offering a total system solution with a personal expert, expert touch from our sales team. Um, we are a part of the Convergence Technologies of Families, um, and we also do have our own in-house Apex 9 brand of equipment. Next slide. So CTI Connect is um, one of four companies supported by Convergence Technologies. CTI Connect is the hardware distribution leg. Um, MitoTech, um, Sakid, you can click again to uh, Perfect. Uh, so MitoTech is an IT network and infrastructure services arm. IP Pay is a pro payment processing gateway and billing service. And INET Capital is a leasing financial services and loans. Um, and with that, I'll introduce Sakid from uh, Cambium Networks. Okay, thank you, Garrett. First things first, I gotta unmute myself. Um, Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining this uh, webinar session. Uh, my name is Sakid Ahmed. I uh, run the EPMP business here at Cambium. Um, today's agenda, more or less, is to get a little bit of a deeper dive into the EPMP 3000 portfolio. Uh, I'm assuming I probably know a lot of people on the call as well, and those that are new, welcome to the webinar. I uh, hope you can get some good information on this. Um, as always, ask a lot of questions. I'm happy to answer them. Anything that I don't know the answer to, I will make sure to come back to you. Uh, if you think of something afterwards, feel free to post it on our forum or you can uh, email me directly if you like. Uh, so with that, we'll get started. Uh, the agenda today, I kind of broke it up in a few sections. And if there are folks here that are, let's say, new to EPMP or new to Cambium, um, I won't give you too big of an explanation, but long story short, Cambium Networks is uh, you know, one of the premier uh, vendors for our wireless infrastructure business uh, for the WISP industry. Uh, I think our claim to fame is the Canopy product. Uh, the EPMP product is uh, becoming uh, very quickly the uh, dominant platform for our WISP industry uh, in terms of deploying and, and doing it in an economical manner. Uh, there's a lot of cool nifty features that we built into the product line and today's uh, product that we are talking about out in the marketplace is the uh, 3000. So uh, we'll go through a little bit of the 3000 portfolio overview. If you have it already deployed, great. I can answer some questions. Uh, if you're considering it, that'll be a good uh, discussion from this webinar. Uh, a little bit about the subscriber portfolio and then some of the new products that uh, are about to come out, uh, as well as a little bit on the competitive landscape. Um, you know, if you're looking at uh, competition in terms of the LTU platform, I'm happy to kind of speak to that and add some color and context from my perspective, and I will uh, do my best to do so in an unbiased manner. Um, I have also got an access to a live system in our lab with about 50 subscribers. It's kind of walk you guys through that system and give you a lay of the land on what the 3000 is doing, what it's supposed to do, um, and things to keep an eye out for. And then the software roadmap, which is obviously one of the most important aspects. I'll talk a little bit about our approach to software. Uh, future considerations and some issues, um, some features, and then um, talk a little bit about some of the open issues we have. So this is meant to be a, um, as, a, as open as possible webinar. 
and be as transparent as a vendor to tell you everything we know about the EPMP portfolio. So with that, if my mouse cooperates, we shall go to the next slide. Uh, high level summary, um, the EPMP 3000, we look at this as the generation three product line or 1000, 2000 being the gen one, gen two. Uh, fundamentally, uh, no big surprise, but the EPMP product line leverages the IEEE uh, 802.11 chipset. And simple reason, it's the economics of it. These SOCs are becoming more and more powerful, packing more and more features for the Wi-Fi industry. The challenge for vendors like Cambium, or for that matter, the Ubiquities and the Microtech is how much customization, how much uh, throwing away can we do of the bad Wi-Fi stuff and create a very, very powerful solution while leveraging the cost of a chipset and passing that savings on to you guys. The Generation 3 uh, EPMP 3000 is built on the 11AC Wave 2 chipset. This is important to distinguish. Uh, we were not the first to come up with an AC product line. In fact, I think we're the last ones. Uh, but both of our, uh, you know, well-respected uh, competitors went down the path of a Wave 1 chipset, which gave you uh, super high modulations at 256 qualm as well as 80 megahertz channel bandwidth. What that lacked and that we uh, banked on in a big way is the multi-user MIMO, the ability to uh, uh, push data to multiple subscribers at the same time and give you higher uh, modulations. Um, so that's kind of the key message about the 3000, along with, uh, needless to say, there's downlink beamforming, there's uh, higher modulations here as well, a better CDI performance in terms of reaching the, uh, reaching the higher mods. If you want to know a little bit of all the details about the product, um, once I go into the AP user interface, I'll kind of highlight some of the things in terms of how the beamforming works, uh, how uplink beam steering uh, works with the beam steering antenna, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, feel free to ask questions about uh, compatibility and all of that as well. I'm sure that's a uh, big uh, question for many uh, in the audience. Moving ahead, along with the 3000, we have a 3000L product, which is starting to see some good traction in the market. This is a two by two 11 AC wave two product. Uh, we love our friends over at RF Elements, and I think they've done a phenomenal job building antennas. So we designed the mechanics of this to adapt to a twist board adapter and attaching anything from a you know, symmetric horn, asymmetric horn, uh, whatnot. So we expect that the software differentiation that we have in terms of scalability a GPS sync, being able to frequency reuse, combined with the horn performance, uh, you have yourself a pretty powerful uh, base station. Uh, it is limited to 64 subscribers, while the 3000 is at 120, and of course you're getting the multi-user MIMO, SFP on the 3000, a 4x4 receive, 4x4 uh, sector antenna in the transmit, so you get two overlapping 90 degrees. A lot of that is in the 3000 uh, full version but the 3000L certainly is a nice entry base station uh, or for low density deployments. Uh, we did uh, launch another product, which you may or may not be interested in. It's a micro pop. That's more or less a 180 degree uh, to, uh, type uh, coverage area. It does not have GPS sync. Um, I don't anticipate in the WISP industry that this is gonna be a big play, but if you happen to you know, provide internet to a, uh, let's say a music festival or some type of outdoor event, um, and you wanna throw up a uh, you know, wide coverage base station and just plug in a bunch of 300-16s, this would be a great solution for that. So not necessarily a big time put up on the tower type thing, but definitely a micro pop application. Uh, moving ahead, um, I'll have another slide showing all the subscriber modules, but we had a 19 and a 19 hour product um, again, a bit different application. Um, North America WISP market, what I have uh, fundamentally seen is, you know, since you guys are serving a lot of the rural market or semi-rural market, everybody's going for the gain. So 25 dBi dishes seems to be the norm. Um, so a panel antenna may be a form factor application in a rooftop or a enterprise type application in a small urban area. Uh, this is a interesting product and this could have its own webinar in its entirety, but uh, I will try to pack it in here. Uh, but this is the uh, very first uh, in the industry, a four by four dual horn product. Uh, 
what this is is uh, leverages the horn characteristics of the antenna with uh, very little side lobe, very good front to back, um, and attaches to a 3000 AP. The way the horns are positioned, the way the, the, the bore sight uh, overlaps on a 60 degree sector, leverages our uh, grouping algorithm and optimizes uh, being able to do uh, multi-user MIMO. Um, we will have some support for things like a split sector where if you wanted to do two horns pointing in two different directions and have some guidance around that, but this product uh, is um, coming out in Q1. We have uh, done some beta and ongoing some beta with some customers who may actually be on this call, uh, but we're seeing some good results in terms of the interference mitigation. Uh, so that is very important to understand that this is not something you just blindly replace, sorry, got ahead of myself, blindly replace the full-fledged 3000 four by four sector. The four by four sector has 17 dBi gain. This has 12 dBi gain. You've got quite a bit of gain deficiency in this product. You're not gonna go for that 10 kilometer long shot but where you will find advantage is that if you have some pretty noisy uplink situations where there's neighboring sectors, neighboring uh, radios blasting away at you, then the lack of side lobes, the good front to back will give you much better uplink performance. Um, so it's a case by case basis, probably more like a micro pop uh, type situation where you throw it up in a congested rooftop or a lower part of a tower and just cover a small residential neighborhood where you don't need the full-fledged sector and you will benefit from the uh, high interference yet able to give the multi-user model. Then there is a four by four uh, Omni antenna, again from a partner of ours, KP Performance, uh, who worked on this antenna with uh, design recommendations from Cambium. Um, this is actually a trial in Colorado and maybe our customers on this call as well, but. Um, he shared these results with us, um, and we'll also have a posting on this on how this antenna is different from, uh, let's say, uh, our good friend uh, Mimosa's uh, Omni. Uh, there are opposite sectors interconnected inside the antenna, uh, and we're able to do uh, mu mimo grouping uh, in a much more effective manner than any other Omnis. Uh, once again, Omni application is going to be limited for you, uh, but do want to share that in the portfolio between dual horn, Omni, Micropop, uh, we're starting to expand the offerings in terms of uh, meeting application needs. A high level summary. So when you think about access points, if you're new to Cambium, the 3000, full flex 3000 is the uh, big bad boy of the portfolio. 3000L gets you in the door, meets certain applications. The workhorse for many years was our EPMP 2000. I think a lot of people love this AP. Um, it was 11N based. It also had the same filtering as the 3000, uh, supported the beam steering antenna and the uplink, did really well, continues to be out there. Uh, but we're starting to see a shift uh, as new towers are going up from moving here to here because everybody's needing more bandwidth. I'm not going to spend time on our generation one. Moving ahead. Uh, on the subscriber side, uh, the 300-25 is your uh, prominent uh, subscriber module that I think is probably more popular in North America. Um, it had some early challenges with some software issues, maybe even a few hardware things, but uh, we've gotten past all of that. Uh, things are in uh, good shape, so be confident in deploying the 300-25. The 300-16... Uh, actually is even a higher volume product for us than the 25, uh, but maybe a bit more in an international environment with shorter distances. Uh, but this follows the uh, highly successful product, uh, which was the Force 1.8. Uh, 300 CSM has uh, same form factor as the 3000L, but no GPS sync, priced differently than the access point. It is a subscriber module only. The application of this I suspect will be good for if you happen to need a very high gain subscriber module, you can throw a dish on it or a horn, whatnot. Or if you're looking for a pretty low cost, powerful point to point product and you want to throw a 28 dBi dish and do a point to point link, this is good for that. Um, and then the 1919R, I talked about it. There is a very small form factor dash 13, a 13 dBi product. Again, it can do MUMIMO. 600 megabits per second, uh, North America market. This is distance limited. 
I would suspect, again, those special events or any other uh, vertical application like uh, that you may encounter, um, you will do that. This last product uh, is not available in North America, so I will not spend time on that. Uh, a full view of the subscriber module portfolio. Um, it's all available on our website. You can get the information, but as you can see, there's a nice wide range of uh, list prices. Um, CTI is a, a phenomenal uh, distributor of ours and has done a great job providing training guidance and they tend to keep stock uh, and uh, will be available to feed you the product as you see needed. We'll skip ahead on the 8 to 11 n stuff. Uh, okay, um, so those sort of product overview, but I wanted to spend a few minutes on the evolution of how we are thinking about the EPMP roadmap. Um, and this is kind of important to give you guys the confidence that if you, are cho if you have chosen EPMP today or are evaluating it, uh, this is an important uh, point to uh, pay attention to. So we started with the whole EPMP 1000. Uh, for us, GPS Sync was our, you know, our, I guess uh, some, sometimes we call it our birthright, but because this is what we built our entire canopy portfolio, our mission was to deliver GPS Sync on an affordable platform. So that's what 1000 was all about. We went from 1000 to 2000 because we said, all right, GPS Sync solves the self-interference interference issues. What about external interference? 2000 came in, we went with a uh, dynamic filters on the 2000 for neighboring channel uh, rejection, and then an uplink beam steering antenna, which uh, in conjunction with the software on the AP uh, will decide, well, I guess the AP will decide when to use a beam steer for the uplink, when to use the sector antenna for uplink. So it's uh, SM by SM. Combination of these two things proved, proved quite powerful. However, you know, throughput wise, it's 20 and 40 megahertz, 64 quant modulation. Um, there was big demand that we need something with more throughput. This is when uh, the 11 AC stuff came in. Uh, and this is where the four by four multi-user MIMO, the higher modulations, everything I talked about earlier, uh, tells the story of uh, higher performance. Uh, in the meantime, in the middle, we also introduced EPMP Elevate. Um, needless to say, Elevate has been a, a good story for a lot of customers with third-party gear that wanted to uh, migrate without having to do a truck roll. Um, this continues to be in the mix and we'll talk to the 3000 AP. All throughout this, you'll see this compatibility story uh, showing up and you won't be the first to beat me up on how difficult compatibility has been and how many issues we've had. But I am happy to say, on one hand, it was one of the most challenging things to get compatibility working across multiple platforms and disconnects and whatnot. But we are uh, feeling that with 4.4.3 release, so we have gotten past our biggest hurdles and uh, a lot of customers are uh, expressing that things are quite stable. Where do we go from here? Um, the exciting thing is now that we've built a compatibility uh, confidence uh, in our solution, we move towards the EPMP 4000. Um, it says 12 by 12 move MIMO with an asterisk. This has been updated since then. It's gonna end up being an eight by eight multi-user MIMO product. Again, you'll have to look at the balancing of this. Higher orders of multi-user MIMO means you also need a lot more density and a lot more subscribers to really benefit from that number of grouping. The lower is actually better because the likelihood of you getting the grouping is higher. Uh, but we are already started the development work on this and any AC subscriber that you deploy in the network will be compatible to the 11AX EPMP 4000. Note that your biggest advantage on day one when you swap out the AP will be that you are now doubling your MUMIMO capability. So you're seeing an incremental performance improvement at the base station level, right? Um, as just like the AC and M story, as you swap out the subscriber modules from AC to AX, now you start to see things like, like OFDMA in both up and down, as well as uplink move MIMO, and let's not forget 1024 qualm like modulations. So I feel that we have a pretty good story because there's an underlying theme to all of this, which is the investment protection. Um, I would love for you guys to buy my AC subscribers left and right, and so would Garrett, and replace everything you have, but we are giving you a smoother migration path. 
And I hope that resonates with customers today and customers in the future, that when we come up with a new base station or new technology, we're not forcing you to, to place things overnight. Yes, you're gonna have to bear the pain of having some issues along the way. Some things, no matter how much we test, we still find bugs in the field and that's probably gonna happen again. We're gonna run betas for six, seven months. Some of you will help us find a lot of these bugs, um, but that's just the nature of the beast. So bear with us. But in summary, that investment protection is a very strong story. And let's move ahead. Um, a little bit on why we're going down the path. You'll notice that um, in our case, I just mentioned 1024 QAM on the 4000, um, but we actually look at two things, the higher order modulation, as well as the multiple input, multiple output. The reason I'm gonna talk about this for a few seconds is that, you know, um, I'll say this in a, in a very honest manner. Um, I have LTU product in my hands. I'm doing some competitive evaluation. There's no big surprise. I'm sure everybody's doing that on my products too. Um, it's a good radio. The fact that it can do 1024 QAM um, is, is a good story, but it fundamentally shows a difference in the approach of these two companies when you look at technology. Um, we believe and it's beyond a belief now because it's proven that our investment in multi-user MIMO is the right investment. Uh, it's proven by our 450M uh, Medusa platform uh, delivering some phenomenal results for networks that are uh, appropriately designed and has the right density. Uh, EPMP 3000 is starting to show multi-user gain as more and more traffic. So our approach has always been worry about the base station performance, get more throughput out of that for less spectrum, um, get investment protection, migration strategy, um, combine multi-user MIMO with uh, things like higher modulation to give that individual subscriber high throughput while not sacrificing the base station throughput. So this has been our approach. We also feel that alongside Medusa and 450M, the IEEE standards or the 3GPP standard or even the 5G, all of that is moving towards multi-user MIMO as one of the key uh, pillars of the technology future. So we think we're on the right place. Does that minimize LTU? Uh, not really, because it's still a good radio. It's just their approach has been to say, let's get the highest modulation. It's the world's best radio, great. Our argument is, you cannot control the environment. So while you get 1024 qualm at two kilometers, three kilometers on day one, somebody fires up an interferer, what happens to the 1024 qualm? How much does it degrade? Versus if you control it at the base station doing multi-user MIMO, even after degradation, you're still able to serve a couple of subscribers at the same time. So there's a fundamental difference in the approach and, um, um, and how we implemented it. Last but not least, when you look at investment protection, um, you're gonna deploy LTU, you're going to have to rip and replace all the AirMax stuff. Um, if you deploy 3000 today, you've heard me say it, we're gonna have a 4000 that's gonna be compatible to every 3000 SM out there. So you're gonna ride this path forward as the needs of your uh, subscriber base. Um, that kind of covers this whole investment protection. I left Mimosa with a question mark. Uh, I've, you know, since the airspan purchase of Mimosa, things uh, I've not heard a lot of noise. I'm sure uh, they're doing well, um, but uh, Moomimo wise, I've seen some uh, early feedback. Both cases of our two other competitors, the uh, the chipset is a Wave One chipset, and I think publicly, uh, Ubiquiti has mentioned that uh, Moomimo is not something they uh, believe in. Okay, and I talk about competition, but I uh, wanted to get that across. Uh, 3000 software. Uh, we are looking at a slight strategy change. Uh, many of you uh, have been active participants in our beta, uh, firmware betas, and have been disappointed how long things have been in beta, uh, the bugs, too many bugs, et cetera, et cetera. So we're kind of looking at a different approach. We're saying we're going to keep, once we reach full stability in a particular release, we'll call that our stable release. And then what is our beta release will very much be a stable release plus new features. So if, and, and that will also take time to get to that full level stability. But if somebody wants to uh, take on those new features, we're kind of saying under in, in small print, 
that with new features, this so-called beta release will have some risks. Um, so today, 443 is our most current and stable release. If you haven't done so, I implore and beg that go and upgrade every AP, every SM using CN Maestro, 11N, elevated device, everything to 443. Um, it's a must. Um, and I have high confidence that that is the right answer for your network today. 4.5 is sitting in the beta right now. Uh, it's got some cool nifty things, the support for the BSA, improved uplink throughput, uh, more stability, EPTP mode, which is gonna be pretty awesome for the 4300-25 for a low latency, high throughput point-to-point -point link. Uh, we have this thing called DCS, which is a dynamic channel selection, um, a clever little functionality for the radios to kind of monitor the environment in the background and be able to switch channels if you have that available. Now, in a large point to multi-point network, this gets complicated, but at least it's the, it's the foundation block to build some more uh, improvement. Um, GPS has been a sore topic. Um, we got hit with some things with the GLONASS on the leap year, but even before that, we've had some challenges with uh, cellular interference as well as some bugs on our own but 4.5 does address some of those. I'm not saying that it will clean up everything, but once you go to 4.5, if there are unique GPS issues, please contact us and we'll work with you on that. Uh, moving ahead, uh, as we move to the 4.6 uh, release, um, big, big disclaimer, things are a fluid, features go in and out. Uh, the release may be split in two, but overall, we're looking at higher ratios for uplink performance, like 5% granularity. So you can now start doing 85-15 and 80-20, things like that. Um, split sector MUMIMO support with third-party antennas. There was a lot of noise about that. 2.5 millisecond frame and CIR is committed information rate. Now, these may break up in releases, uh, but the third bullet in the middle is something that we are... Uh, looking at implementing, which is an application-based traffic viewing and a baseline for smart QoS. Um, the idea is that in the AP itself, you're gonna be able to see the type of traffic based on application that's uh, going across the network. Um, we'll start off by offering this as a viewable uh, feature. And as we implement uh, things like a smart QoS, where you can now set QoS rules, based on application, uh, that's going to be a, your favorite word of the day, a licensable feature. Um, I'm already feeling the uh, angry emojis coming across the link, but uh, uh, the long story short is we're making some investments on the software side. And if we, if we feel with your agreement that this is a very valuable feature, then I think it's fair that uh, we charge something incremental in order to support the R&D of this. Uh, but it's just a preview. We'll let you guys play with it in terms of the, just the viewing. I'm sure there will be lots of chatter around it, but um, uh, we'll see how that uh, path moves forward. Okay, and I think that's the last slide from my part. Um, right. Before we move to questions, let's take a look at um, a live system for what is, sorry. So this is a EPMP 3000 AP in our lab. It's in a radiated environment, um, but it is in very close distance and it's in a very large anechoic chamber. This has about, I guess I haven't been logging into the radio. Oh, there you go. 50 registered subscribers. Um, we are pushing traffic with a traffic generator uh, called Ixia load and it's using a, like a layer two switch and we're sending equal traffic to every subscriber um, in a continuous manner. So I guess the things hey, that you want to look at. The, um, oh, sorry, sorry. PowerPoint. Thanks. Thank That's you okay. for. Yep. Yep. This is where Zoom gets to be fun and I will fix that in one second. Uh, Oh, I think that's it. Garrett, is that better? Are you seeing the product yep. UI now? Here we are, okay. thank you. Yeah, thank you. So um, if you've seen the UI before, I'm not gonna spend too much time on it, but this has got 50 subscribers logged into it. The configuration, eh, let's just go over a few things, right? 
you got your country code, SSID, range, max range, channel bandwidth. Uh, we keep, we, some reason we love leaving 80 megahertz and beta quality. I think it's uh, our development team's way of saying, don't go 80 megahertz and pollute the environment. Uh, but, uh, you know, you have some other things here, a co-location mode that has to do with uh, co-locating with the uh, PMP 100 product, 2.5 millisecond, as well as the 450 product. Um, a lot of people had many questions when the GPS issue was happening about the synchronization hold off time. This essentially helps you to uh, keep transmitting uh, even if you lose GPS sync. So you can increase this value. Uh, but ultimately our proposal, the, the approach we've taken at Cambium in general is if you don't have sync working, we wanna give you enough buffer to fix things. But uh, in the long term, we don't want you to keep running uh, without sync. It, it just causes a lot of self-interference on your network. These ratios are where things are gonna change. We're gonna give you more granularity. Uh, the guard interval stuff is um, related to the backwards compatibility and it does give you a little bit of a throughput boost. Um, something that um, I oftentimes tell our support team to tell customers that you know, you've got this max rate concept and you also have this on the subscriber for the uplink. You know, one of the, one of the, one of the big strengths of EPMP is the rate adapt algorithm, which says, hey, uh, based on my signal to noise ratio, my interference, um, how many packets are being lost or how many error packets, I'm gonna rate up or rate down, kind of like your car transmission and changing the gear. Uh, we are a bit aggressive in trying to maximize throughput. In certain cases, you may end up seeing like, man, this thing is bouncing around too much, my latency spiking. This is where you can start playing saying, you know what, I'm better off telling the radio, don't try to go to the max modulation actually drop and that may calm things down where I'm not bouncing up and down. Um, just one little tip here, um, but it's not every day that you would wanna do that. It's really, if you're seeing a high latency and jitter, then uh, you know that things are bouncing up and down. Uh, quality of service, I won't get into this, but this is where CIR would kick in and the traffic shaping. Uh, let's go to monitor wireless. Um, you have your overall performance, Ethernet stats, uh, SFP stats, wireless downlink, uplink, you know, session reboots. This is where things got interesting because when we had those session disconnects, this was one of the areas where uh, you know, people were watching things. Um, but you'll notice that there's device reboots, soft reboots, hard reboots, and each of these have a little pop-up telling you what that means. Um, this is probably my request that when you do call our support team, not only take that support dump log, um, but also um, also uh, provide information such as, hey, is this a soft reboot that's happening or a hard reboot, and et cetera, et cetera. Um, moving ahead, uh, wireless is where actually performance down here. The other key thing that uh, you'll see uh, yourself is that, um, you know, packet drops and uplink downlink is always important to keep an eye on. Um, downlink retransmission packets that kind of tells you which guy is retransmitting quite a bit. Um, and that's an indication of, you know, having some localized interferers and things like that. In most cases we're recovering things and you shouldn't have to worry about it. The MCS distribution is a pretty nifty thing that uh, is helpful to understand the health of your network, right? At the end of the day, you want the majority of your traffic in the higher modulations. Uh, when a subscriber is hovering down here, you wanna take a look at what's going on. It might be interference, uh, but it could be misalignment, it could be something else. You wanna stay away from single stream. The more double dual stream, higher mods you can get for down and up, the more you're packing uh, the system. Um, I had a call with uh, one of our customers yesterday about frame time, but downlink frame time is good to see. Right now, all 50 SMs are blasting traffic, so I'm using the AP and the downlink quite a bit. I'm sure everybody's waiting to see what the throughput chart looks like. So but I wanna take you down monitor wireless first. Um, nothing more here, link distances, session time again, modulations, et cetera, et cetera. Groupable STAs is key. And it probably does deserve a little bit of time. Um, this shows how many subscribers are MooMimo groupable to the MAC address of 54A8 and that's six subscribers. In this case, it's 13 subscribers, 16. So you see a good number of subscribers that are groupable. 
keep in mind, groupability is just one part of it. You gotta have, and by the way, here's a good, a good data point. There's five gigahertz integrated radio. This is the old school 11N subscriber. Then you got a mix of uh, AC. So if anybody told you backwards compatibility is not working, this is proof that it is. Uh, anyway, back to groupable STAs. Uh, grouping is one thing, but uh, you gotta have traffic, right? The more traffic, basically think of it this way. The AP has to be congested. AP has to say, holy cow, I've got packets coming more or less at the same time for two of these guys. Oh, wait, you know, physically they're groupable, great. Problem solved. Oh, now I got traffic. I'm going to send it that way. So a lot of people that I talk to saying, hey, I've got my 3000, but I'm not really seeing Mumaima. I've got groupable SMs. My, my message to you is start pushing data, right? I think the reality is as much as our customers, right, uh, the end users are asking for higher bandwidth packages. The reality is households are still not pulling as much as they think they want to pull. And the likelihood of everything hitting at the same time is low too. So um, I won't spend any more time on that, but that's the, that's the message there. Uh, let's see, I'll get to the super chart in one second. I just want to show one last thing if I'm remembering it right. Um, audio service, no. Okay, never mind. All right, um, so this guy is, let's see what the graph shows. So the graph says, this is a 20 meg channel across 50 SM that's pulling about 120 meg. Uh, throughput, and you're seeing some MU gain at sometimes 40 meg, another 40 meg. By the way, this is TCP traffic, so this is a bunch of uh, FTP the server and clients across this simulated tool. But there's a little bit of randomness in it too. Um, there's a decent MUMIMO gain, but I think if we uh, purposely push traffic to some more, this MUMIMO gain can increase even more. But I like this data. I think it's a good if I saw a system running like this, um, it's a good good thing. It's a good stable system. Needless to say, real world traffic will be very different. You may have five users out of the 50 that are really pulling your data. Uh, the only other thing I wanted to show on tools is on wireless link test, this concept of single radio, dual radio, dual radio lets you do a MUMIMO link test. Um, but the only other thing that I guess we removed from the GUI was the single user mode versus uh, Mumaimo mode. We remove that because it's automatic. And this is sort of important to remember is that even if you don't have Mumaimo, 3000 is giving you something pretty cool in the form of downlink beam forming. So if, if I'm talking to a single subscriber, those two 90 degree overlapping antennas are directing their energy uh, to the same guy. So you're getting an instant doubling of power and 3 dB gain towards that subscriber. Um, so you get, you're potentially going to have a better link budget because of that. In the uplink, you have the 4x4 receive, so you're getting another 3dB there. Um, and then last but not least, beam steering antenna, which is going to come out in 4.5, is going to give you some additional help. Big uh, important point, beam steering antenna is not going to give you as much help as it did on a 2000, because you don't need that help. The 3000 has better receive with four receivers. It has a narrower sector. The, 2090 slash 120 was a um, 90 degree, sorry, 90 degree, 120 degree sector versus this one is more like a 65, 3 dB drop off. So you're going to get a lot of uplink help already. Now, some people have talked about uplink performance issues, which we're fixing. That's actually more of a software. Uh, so at the end of the day, when everything calms down, you're going to see some rock solid uplink performance as well. Okay, uh, with that, that's been almost uh, 40 minutes of me talking nonstop. And with that, I will shut up. And Sue, is this where uh, you would like me to just uh, go to the Q&A? Yeah, Gary, if you could just, there's a, a few questions out here already. So if you'd just like to read the questions and um, go over some of the answers, that'd be great. Okay, and don't, oh. Well, always ask tough questions. What's the deal with the CN Archer EPMP support for iOS? It's been pushed back multiple times. Uh, yes, it has. It's just uh, development delays and getting things prioritized. Um, I will check on a latest data or date for that, and I will post that on the community um, and let you know. And the next two questions had to do with the fact that they could not see the UI because I was not sharing. Follow-on question. 
There's been some confusion on the forum as to what firmware to run in production. I have seen recent posts from the Camion that says to run 4.x, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I hope I responded to that already in the presentation that I'm pleading with you. Close your eyes, go to 443. Uh, life will be much better. Don't worry about 3.5.6 or any of that. Everything goes to 4.4.3. If anybody tells you otherwise, send them to me. Okay, uh, here's a question. Uh, if I'm already having such great success with the EPM 3000, is there any reason to move to look at 450 platform? Um, it depends. Uh, you're, it's a case-by-case -case situation. Um, here's what you're going to do. If you end up tomorrow with a a situation where you have uh, you know 150 subscribers that you're getting in a good density, everybody's wanting 50, 60, 100 meg packages ready to pay. 450 is a great platform for throwing it into that most challenging environment. It will scream once you get to that level of density. Um, if the density is not so high, economics don't justify it, then 3000 is your answer. Um, in mix 2000 SM and with elevated as well, what settings need to be set for compatibility? None whatsoever. Make sure all the subscribers are 443 elevated as well as the legacy SMs. There are no settings that you need to set in order to make compatibility work. Question was how wide is the channel? I'm assuming the question was uh, related to this demo setup. I believe the channel size is 20 megahertz. It's 20 megahertz running at 51.8. E-Detect, gone. I can't believe there are fans of E-Detect, but yes, E-Detect is gone because uh, you now have a spectrum analyzer, which is not running here, but go play with the spectrum analyzer on 3000 because there's also a secondary screen on spectrum analyzer that gives you interfere sources. So we basically took eDetect and combined it with a raw energy graph and uh, gave you something uh, much more powerful. What is tentative ETA of EPMP4K? It's far away enough that you should confidently buy and deploy 3,000 and force 300 subscribers. Um, I know that was a clever answer, but uh, the truth is uh, 4K development will take time and it's uh, at least uh, 2021 before we uh, can talk about 4K in the mix. Right, where can we see the results of 3000L with KP performance? I showed a chart um, showing that. I believe one of our customers posted this on WISP's talk, and I think there's a post on our forum as well. If you post this question there, I'm sure uh, we can engage there along with our friendly customer and uh, share the results of that. I glossed over split horns in different directions. Is it available today or do I need to wait to deploy it? Um, I did gloss over it a little bit because uh, it just, Yesterday, we just had the discussion how to approach, but yes, there will be true split horn support. Um, we have a little bit of a write-up that's available in 4.5. There's going to be a setting in the UI where you check split horn or split antenna. Um, the key there is that you're going to have to have them in sort of opposite direction, but uh, you will see that support in the release notes once 4.5 comes out officially and, and something on the forum that we will post. When was EPMP 4000 talked about? This is the first time we have ever heard about it. I have not heard anything from vendors or at Whisper Palooza 2019. That's correct, because 4000 is our next generation platform. Our focus has been uh, the 3000. Um, it's a couple of years away. Uh, 2021 is, is the time frame. Um, we'll probably get uh, engagement from Cambium for beta and early feedback, but uh, overall it still, it still weighs out. But again, I wanted to emphasize that you should think about the 3,000 today because you can have the confidence that the 3,000 subscribers that you've installed uh, will be compatible. There is a sticky post in the forum. 432 release is targeted for pure EPMP 3000 networks and backwards force compatibility mode. However, certain features are not okay. This is an old sticky uh, post. I think we need to unstick it so it disappears towards the bottom. The plain and simple answer is uh, 443. Um, I'll take care of that uh, post right after this meeting. 
Yes, uh, you're right, Eric. If that is inaccurate, it should be removed. I will do so. Um, are there any real, real? Uh, are there any real-world swap data from pure ubiquity AC to pure EPMP3000? Uh, I'm sure there is. Um, there are people that have done it. Um, I'll be happy to, or along with CTI, I will be happy to point you to some of our customers who have done that and share data. Uh, do we need four or five for beam forming? Will this work with force 200 CPAs? Let me cover beam forming versus beam steering one more time. Um, from our terminology per perspective, you do beam forming in the downlink where the two overlapping 90 degree sectors are giving you a 3 dB additional gain by beam forming. It's the uplink beam steering antenna that we're talking about in four or five. And to answer you, Jim, yes, you do need 4.5 for beam steering support. The beta 4.5 that's on our forum right now has frequent disconnects that show up on the UI for the beam steering antenna. We're fixing that in about a week and a half to two weeks, we'll have the uh, 4.5 update to address those issues. Um, yes, it will work with uh, force 200 CPs. Are we ever going to see EPMP in CBRS? Um, you know, we just launched our 450 platform in three gig. Um, and right now we don't anticipate seeing anything in uh, CBRS for EPMP. Okay, uh, on SMs, do I need to have force sector enabled when using a sectorized antenna for AP or can just leave it to auto? Will this degrade performance in any way? No, it will not degrade performance in any way and you can leave it completely auto. Let the AP decide when to use a sports sector or when to use the beam steering. So either 2.5 or 5 millisecond guard is okay with elevated and force 180 SMs. Uh, you mean 2.5 or 5 millisecond uh, frame is okay. Yes, once 2.5 millisecond is supported, you can choose either one uh, and you set it at the AP and the SMs all, uh, automatically know which frame uh, size to use. Uh, is Force 300 SM compatible with EPMP 2000 AP? Uh, the answer is yes. This is what we long time ago talked about, the idea of forward compatibility. Um, but make sure, again, everything is on 443, the 2000 as well as the 300 SM. Is there a penalty for triggering MUMIMA? I heard there may be extra latency of jitter for clients when MUMIMA is triggered. Uh, no, you've heard wrong, not the case. There is no penalty for triggering MUMIMO. The system will take care of it itself. That's the whole foundation of this design and there is no penalty. Um, since the unit does support GPS sync, which Packet Plus sync box would be compatible with the EPMP 3000? Uh, you got me there. I just don't remember all the Packet Flux model numbers. Uh, I would suggest post it on our forum. I think Forrest Christian looks at our forum as well. Um, maybe he can respond. If not, I will dig that up and respond. Um, is the 4000 going to be more polished when released before being released so we don't have issues like we do with EPMP 3000, which still seems that it's not 100% ready for prime time? Uh, number one, uh, upgrade to 443. Come back. Let me know if you're seeing any issues, but I do feel that we are at that 100% with 443. Number two, that's right. We do want to make sure 4000 is released with as many of these issues uh, addressed. And therefore, we will take our time testing, betaing, and cleaning things up before we release it. That's, a, that's my commitment to the customer base. I have a 3000 on my roof right now. It is my first access point. I'm very new to this and could use some help setting it up. My area is very unique and then I'm uh, ooh, broadcasting to an island. Is there anyone from Cameo that could screen share with me? Absolutely. Um, this is Art Schenberger. I hope you caught my email address in the beginning. Shoot me an email there, or you can hit me up on the community or the WISH talk. I will get somebody to screen share and uh, give you a little training and walk you through your system. No problem at all. Just uh, reach out to us. Uh, using 3000, a new mono, mono antenna for new tower. Mono, mono meaning a uh, omni, maybe. I'm not sure what you mean by that. Will advanced features like beam forming work, capacity of such? Uh, Richard, you have to explain to me what exact antenna you're referring to here. If it's an Omni from KP, then yes, uh, it will work in terms of multi-user MIMO, but you will not have beam forming in the downlink. 
you are welcome, Eric. You said a thank you. Ah, is there any hope of being able to elevate Ubiquity AC gear someday? Uh, honest answer, nope, that hope is not there. Um, moving on, on EPMP 2K, a poor signal client can impact the overall capacity of the entire AP? No, it cannot. Um, if you have seen any of the early presentations of EPMP, one of the things we talked about was air fairness. Um, the way the scheduler is designed, we allocate time, equal time to all subscribers, regardless of where they are. Uh, when you don't have that, the other way you allocate um, time is based on bandwidth needs. So when a subscriber that's in a very poor modulation comes home and fires up his uh, Netflix, AP will start saying, oh, I'm just gonna give you as much time as possible because you really need all this bandwidth. And when you do that, you're not being airfare and that causes the up close SMs to suffer. One of the core differences of EPMP, you know, while we talk about GPS sync a lot, there's, the, there's a lot of other little things that make the system so robust. And one of those things is air fairness where we're allocating equal time to all subscribers and not uh, driving performance down. What SFP and power fiber cable is recommended for the EPMP 3000? There is a Cambium SFP that we sell. That's the re official recommendation. Um, let's just say most SFPs will work just fine. And I'm sure CTI can point you to some accessories. I don't have a quick answer for which fiber cable is recommended. Um, it's a good question to post on forums and in uh, Facebook groups, there's a lot of experts in this area that will be happy to answer you, Mike. Um, oh, ooh, there's a good one. Are there any plans for a hardware revision for the Force 300 to improve the mounting? Yes, the mounting sucked on day one. We did improve the U-bracket. That is should be starting to coming out with new products. So um, we did hear you and improve it, but we did not completely redo it. Uh, you will be happy to know that on one of our first AX products, we did recruit five or six of our WISP customers to get their feedback. And I have made it a mandatory requirement that our mechanical engineer climbs a tower in the Chicago winter with thick gloves, with tools hanging and mount the radio before we ship it. Um, they have to feel the pain of installation before we uh, get this design out. So that's how we're addressing it. Uh, let's see, what about a DC network switch with multiple power input and 24 and 48 view volt output similar to Nutanix? There is a product in the, the CN matrix uh, line uh, that is on its way. It's called a WISP switch. Uh, it's coming out uh, later in the year, but don't quote me on that. We can uh, <coughs> take that offline. Ah, somebody all the way from Burkina Faso, Cambium is very hard to get. What third party SM would you recommend? No, we're not gonna recommend a third-party SM. I'm gonna solve your problem. So uh, email me right after this call um, at uh, sakid.ahmed at cambionetworks.com. Let's figure out how to get product in your hands. Let's see. Um, is this new Omni antenna available from KP Performance now as we just ordered what I thought were the new antennas for EPMP 3000? Were these not the right ones? Uh, Omni is only from KP. Cambium does not have Omni. So if you ordered Omni, then you ordered the right thing from AP. What you order from Cambium is probably the sector antenna, which is not the wrong antenna. It really depends on what you're looking to use it. All right, does EPMP 3K handle noise as well as a robust EPMP 2K did? We believe it does because it's got the dynamic filter. It's got all this extra um, beam forming and uh, receive chains and an error sector. So it should do well and it does do well. And you should uh, see that in your results. Oh, yes, the bracket on the 200 was perfect. I agree. We tried to save some cost because the 300, as you see, is slightly more expensive and we were trying to squeeze out cost. But lesson learned, we're going to go back to a better design. I apologize if I went through these questions really fast, but I tried to pack in and answer as much as I could. It's 157, and I believe we have come to the end of the questions. I'd like to thank everyone for attending the webinar. Um, there were some very wonderful questions. Uh, thank you for explaining uh, the the uh, 3000. And um, we hope that everybody will attend the upcoming webinars that we have um, moving forward. Okay, okay, well, thank you. And this will end our uh, Cambium webinar for today.